this year as well saw us participating in the 2012 Olympic Games in London with one of our smallest teams ever, six competitors. And of course, our annual General Assembly and elections in October generated much hype in the media. And in this regard, I would once again like to thank the National Federations for electing me and pledge to continue my work towards the advancement of Olympism in this country. There are many challenges, but we need to more effectively convey to the public of Barbados our work and our mission. Concerns me that only during the Olympic Games that real extensive interest is shown in Olympic sport. The fact that we have numerous projects and programs, the fact that we take teams in excess of 100 to CSC, Commonwealth, and Pan American Games, and get us little interest, and we must find a way to remedy this deficiency. The disarm remains committed to fostering the development of the youth through sports, a focus which is clearly in the line with the mandate of the Barbados Olympic Association. Additionally, the design has led from the front in the Special Olympics Association of Barbados as evidenced by our recent support of their Road to World Games 2015 fund, which is has just not started. I would like to take the opportunity to encourage all of corporate Barbados, all of you here, to support this worthwhile cause as they look to go to World Games 2015. So as you can see, the DSL is indeed ready to take the mantle of being a strategic partner for the Barbados Olympic Association by supporting its various programs. We look forward, Mrs. Scott, to a very long and fruitful relationship and partnership with the DSL, where we know we can take Barbados sport and development still bigger than One of our greatest failures in sport is that we treat it like mango season and plum season and chenet season three months of the year. You cannot have one to play at the international level and treat sport like it's a fruit. If you are really interested in participating at the highest level in sport, then you have to be in it 12 months of the year. But even before we get there, even before we get there, we need to make sure that the steps are placed exactly where they need to be placed for young people, first of all, to want participate, right? It is unconscionable to take a child that is five or six years old to put them to play football and cricket and try to teach them technique. That's insane. They don't even have physical literacy yet and you're trying to give them, to teach them technique. And worse yet, you see people watching a seven-year-old, a eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old and say that child has real talent. They could be the best thing. Well, I'll tell you about talent. I have a son. I have a son. At eight years old, he showed tremendous talent for football. He was the greatest. Everybody watching, oh my God, this is a great player. At nine, he was playing football. And at the ten, by twelve, he was finished playing football. <laughs> by, the, by that time, he was, he was finished. Right? Talent identity. Listen, everybody has talent. Everybody has potential. The chair here has potential. It has potential to make you nice and competent when you sit on it, but it has potential to be a deadly weapon if somebody pick it up. This whole room has potential to make a good bonfire. <laughs> How you channel potential determines where it ends at the end of the day. There's a concept in economics called ethnic fracturalization. Ethnic fracturalization. And to give you an example of that, I will tell you that in Kenya, you are a Maasai first before you are a Kenyan. You are a tribesman first before you are a Kenyan. So that they follow tribal law before they follow Kenyan law. A Maasai does not need permission to go and kill a lion. Everybody else does. Because in order for him to go through the rite of passage from a boy to a man, he has to go out and hunt a lion. And if you go to the Tanzanian border, you will see Maasai warriors crossing the border without a passport. None of us can do that. 60, 70, 80 years ago, we were West Indians. All of us. When we went onto the field of play, we were West Indian players. And as time evolved and we became independent, we became Bijan. Trinidadians, 
Grenadians, Vincentians, Jamaicans, Ghanaians. And by becoming independent, we became independent thinkers and we had independent agendas. Now, when you read media reports about cricket, they talk about how many Bajans on the team and Trinidad got eight members on the team. And now we start to become fractured based on geographic location and culture. There's no coming back from that. Until we understand that we belong to the human race and that we collectively, when we do anything, unless we do it together, we will never succeed. Never. If you checked in this room the number of people whose lives were changed as a result of sport, I'm sure that very few of them would have put here, and I'm sure that most of them would be top citizens in Barbados. Sport is not about sport. Sport is about social interaction. Sport is about socializing. When I looked at these two young people who came up for surfing, if it was not fun for them when they started, if there was not a huge social aspect to it, where would the motivation come about for them to continue and to be as good as they are? If you stand up and you watch young people play sport in an open field, you would see that everything is about having fun. The minute you take it and make it about competition and make it about results, everything falls apart. If you don't have people passionate about playing cricket, cricket will never come back. If you don't have people passionate about surfing, surfing will be nothing. In Trinidad, we try our best with surfing. For some reason, Bobby does it a little bit better than Trinidad and surfing. Right? There's a reason for that. You have better beaches, you have better water, and people know about you. <laughs> oh, listen, it's it, 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 it a simple thing. Sport is about people. If the sport is not being carried to people, then it cannot succeed. It is not a magic one day we're going to get up and we're going to win everything in cricket, or we're going to win things in football, or we will win um, 100 meters in track and field. You know, we watch the success of Jamaica, Grenada, and Trinidad in track and field. The success of that is really the success of the gap between when you finish secondary school before you get international. If you don't address that gap with some level of planning, then you cannot, you cannot and will not end up with, with, with success at the top. Trinidad and Tobago is looked at as a very successful country when coming to the Olympic movement. We have 1.3 million people. We have been in the Olympic movement since 1948 and we have gotten 18 medals at the Olympic Games. Since 1996, we have gotten 12 of those medals. And we have won medals in every Olympic Games since 1996 to date. As a matter of fact, we had projected that in London, we would have won five medals. We won four. We have projected that there was a possibility of winning seven. What's interesting is that Two of the medals that was won out of the four, we didn't project at all. And the areas where we expected to get medals from didn't happen. And it brings us back to trying to make projections on Olympic success and whether podium performance at the Olympic Games is important in the Olympic movement. If you have a society, on environment where there is no physical education. Physical education teaches the body physical literacy. It teaches you this arithmetic and English of sport. If you have a society and a school system that is devoid of physical education, then you will not do well in sport. If you do not have a pathway that links primary school education and primary school sport to secondary school education and secondary school sport to club sport because I want to tell you in the absence of the social interaction with clubs sport will be nothing because it is the social interaction that makes sport the interesting thing that it is. 
And once you have the club system in place, you then move to national and international. But there's a big, there's a gap inside of there that has to be attended to. And that is a gap called collegiate sport. In Trinidad and Tobago, 300,000 people participate in football. More people than the population of Barbados. We're not good in football at all. They don't have to believe that we're very good in football. But we're not. The sport of track and field has 1,700 participants. 1,700. 300,000, 1,700. We have had more success in track and field than in any other sport put together. Cricket has 10,000 participants. It's almost 30 to 1 to football. There are three things that make sport successful. Participation, access to the highest level of competition, and a pathway that connects all. When a child is born, there are three ways that a child learns. Three ways that you teach. There's a the cognitive intelligence, there's a the psychomotor intelligence, and there's something called the affective domain, the emotional intelligence. All of us who want to go to school and do well, and become lawyers and doctors and engineers, we have to first learn English and maths. Sums, arithmetic, however you want to call it. Then we go on and we learn a little bit about history, and we learn a little bit about geography, and you come out of school asking yourself, why the hell did I learn all of this? Because you need cognitive intelligence in order to do what you want to do well. 